A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, I'm Victoria Meyer. Welcome back to The Chemical Show. This week, I am speaking with Juliana Pantelena, who is the marketing head of surfactants for Sepsa Chemica, based in Madrid. She is an Italian-Brazilian chemical engineer who graduated in Sao Paulo. She's been in the surfactants industry for the majority of her career in both ag chem as well as home and personal care, and has worked globally, including in Brazil, the U.S., and Spain for companies including Dow and Occitano. Her focus today at SEPSA is the strategy on how they grow, improve the current portfolio, develop and implement the sustainability goals of the company. So we're going to have a great conversation. Juliana, welcome to The Chemical Show. Hi, Victoria. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for being here. Let's start by talking about your origin story. What got you okay. interested in chemicals and surfactants and what eventually brought you to SEPSA? Oh, that's that's a good question. Um, so, as you said, I'm Brazilian, and so I lived my whole my whole almost my whole life uh, there. And since school, I was always very interested in chemistry. You know, organic chemistry used to be my favorite uh, subject in school, and I always wanted to learn more and more. Had no idea how hard it would be when we actually started to <laughs> study it during college, right? Uh, my mom um, and my dad, they used to love uh, uh, these, uh, well, chemistry and, you know, like all the physics, mathematics and everything related. Um, and at that point, I decided by the end of uh, the my college just to go to the university and be a chemical engineer. Um, I used to love, you know, arts, dance um, and all of that movies. But at the point that I had to make a decision of, what am I going to do with my life? I really wanted to be a chemical engineer. And then I started, you know, college in Brazil. I finished over there. Um, and uh, I joined Dow, uh, Dow Chemical Company, and I stayed there for about 10 years. Um, in that period, I was kind of, well, everywhere. I started as a trainee. I moved to sales. Then I went to marketing. Uh, I was an expert for three years in Midland, Michigan, came back to Brazil, had a product manager role. All of that, the majority of my life, as, a, as you mentioned, I was in the agrochemical market as a chemical supplier. And then I moved to Occiteno as the, the global marketing manager for um, agrochemicals in that matter, but always in surfactants. So my life for this whole almost 15 years was dedicated to surfactants. And the more that I learned about surfactants, the more I liked them because they are everywhere. They are actually they are everything everywhere. That we do. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of eat them, we put them in our heads, we put them in our skin, we wash our clothes. I mean, um, so it, it got me fascinated about everything, you know, like all oh, the organic chemistry and plus what we can actually do in the market. So it felt really interesting. And, and, you know, all of these markets got me even more passionate about it. <laughs> yeah. I think that's interesting. I always say it's, um, you know, when I would, when I worked in the surfactant business at Shell, I'd say, you know, it's the soapy stuff, right? Cause it's <laughs> everywhere. It's everywhere that you're, as you say, yes. washing your clothes, washing your hair, touching, um, your skin and other products and uh, exactly. it's amazing stuff. So, and, and it so now triggers you, everything, right? Yeah. So it does. It, it's, it's it awesome. really does. Yeah. 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 Sure. yeah. And it's one of those things where people don't, um, people downplay chemicals, right? We know this. And yet they don't <laughs> necessarily understand that everything around them that allows them, allows us, frankly, to live the lifestyles that we live are as exactly. a result of chemicals exactly. and chemistry. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So tell us a little bit about SEPSA um, and what you do there. 
Sure. So um, finishing in at Occitano, I moved to CEPSA as the uh, marketing head. And CEPSA is a global company. We are a Spain-based company uh, that it's been here for over 40, 50 years in Spain, but not only in Spain, but also in Canada and Brazil, where we also have our manufacturing plants, where we produce LAB. Um, CEPSA has other products as well as in our portfolio like solvents and phenol, but my main um, uh, focus in CEPSA is dedicated to surfactants. So mainly I have LAB and also our alcohols portfolio. And if I go a little bit and discuss uh, or tell you a little bit about CEPSA on the LAB side, LAB, for those who knows, is uh, like the most used uh, molecule on detergent uh, production, right? So we produce like what is the base uh, up until it becomes LAS. And LAS is the real surfactant that is the base for the most of the majority of the surfactants in the world, over 75%-ish on the consumption on the, the surfact on the detergents formulations. Um, so SEPSA is the leading producer in the world with at least these three plants that I mentioned in these three countries that I mentioned to you. Um, we have more than double the size of the second uh, competitor in, in the industry. So it's a large company uh, on this industry, on the home care industry. And we are also improving and increasing our portfolio on the alcohols and surfactants as well. So this is bringing together a nice portfolio for the home and personal care markets. Yeah. So I know so that's that's a great overview. Thank you. And and I know that um, you know Sepsa also is a refining company, energy and refining, which also ties in very well to LAB from a feedstock perspective. Yes. You know, with this focus on sustainability, a energy transition, how does that affect Sepsa Chemical? Well, and I would tell you a little bit on, on my personal view, because interesting enough, you know, being able to be in other companies moving from one continent to another, I, I see that SEPSA is extremely committed to sustainability. And, and I can tell you because I can tell you from the employees, the teams that we work together, sustainability is, I can easily tell you that it's at least 95% of our discussions on a daily basis. It's interesting. Wow. And I don't know if it is because we are in Europe that also triggers sustainability in a different way, you know, with our day to day lives, personally speaking. But um, so going back to, to your question, um, SEPSA as a corporation understands, and there are several drivers in Europe as well, that we have to do a shift into sustainability, right? So as a corporation where we have refinery and ex uh, exploration and production and other uh, business units, uh, sustainability is part of our drivers. So we want uh, to decarbonize ourselves. We want to drive the industry as a whole uh, for a more sustainable uh, solutions. And when I go to SEPSA Chemicals, uh, our piece of the whole, uh, in the whole industry, let's put it this way, um, I can see that we are shifting our production of you know, our main uh, molecule, which is LAB, into a sustainable LAB. What does that mean, right? So we have launched in last year what we call the next LAB. Next LAB is our um, sustainable LAB solutions uh, for a few main reasons. So as I mentioned, LAB is the most used molecule for detergents and for a just not going to say an obvious reasons, but everybody that does a detergent, they know. Uh, uh, LAB cleans. LAB is the best molecule that it's been in the market forever, and it actually works, but right. it's fossil-based, right? So seeing everything that is going on on sustainability, how we have to change, we need to decrease CO2 emissions, we need to change the chemical industry, which is kind of an exciting moment to be. Um, and that triggers changes in our raw materials, right? So why not, why try to change the whole molecule if you can only change your raw materials, the way that you produce your product, you decarbonize your plants, you decrease emissions on scope one or two, but you also can decrease emissions on your full product by the end of it. So in the end, what is triggering all of these changes at SEPSA is sustainability, is decreasing mm -hmm. emissions, is following what the market is looking for. And, and I have been seeing these changes over and over and over inside of SEPSA in, ch in changing our raw materials and changing the way that we produce our products. Yeah, awesome. Well, and in fact, when uh, when 
we met, we were at ACI uh, earlier this year. Yeah. And I know that was one of the topics of conversation throughout the conference was um, really about changing the molecule, creating a more sustainable or bio-based product at the beginning of the value chain versus at the end of the value chain, because it has far more impact, sure. um, et cetera. So it sounds like you guys are on that same track with that. Um, for sure, so, for sure. So as you've um, as you've rolled out uh, next LAB, Unilever has been one of the first partners that you guys have um, announced um, in doing that. How did that partnership come about, um, and what's important about that for you? Sure. So um, in in the end, I think that, um, and not only in the chemical industry, but definitely I can tell about the, the, the chemical industry that we need to understand what our customers are looking for, right? And and I would say that the home care industry and definitely driven by the top three uh, producers in the world, Unilever, PNGs, Henkels, and so many others that have so many uh, important targets on sustainability uh, are driving what needs to be done, right? And listening to them is actually what drove us to, to make our changes. So when we talk about performance, what needs to be done uh, in, in a molecule, it's there, LAB is there. And also what needs to be done on the sustainable? We need to go fossil free. We need to decrease emissions uh, on, on CO2 emissions. So kind of listening to them, long-term partnership with all of the industry, you know, like important players in different geographies as well, understanding what they want and going back to our R&D units together with the marketing team, together with the sales team and understanding, okay, where is the marketing driving us? What are they looking for? And yeah. uh, triggering new developments with the sustainability group, kind of being the base of the whole thing and say, okay, let's go this way, let's go that way. And 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 finally getting a new product. Awesome. Yeah, so definitely being consumer driven um, as sure. at the end of it, right? Because for uh, sure. They are for always sure. driving the trends in our industry. For sure, for sure. Yeah. So what's actually the feedstock for um, Next LAB? So it's bio-based. So sure, sure. And we have uh, three versions of Next LAB. Uh, the first one um, that is already in the market, that is uh, what we call Next LAB R, are from renewables. So in that matter is our, I would say like our green uh, raw materials. Renewables can be bio, uh, biomass bio biomass um, so cpko coconut oil and other vegetable oils uh, that would have on the paraffin side of the molecule so longer chain on on the uh -huh. molecule um, that can actually be part of our uh, production right, right. Um, at the same time we have next lab uh, low carbon which uh, we launched actually during aci uh, in January this year, and the low carbon at, right now is available for our North American region, actually, uh, because it's done in our Canada facility. Um, and um, the, the low carbon basically sets, it's, it's how we produce the product. So it is still a fossil-based product, but we are decarbonizing the production of it. So hmm. it, in none of the less, we are decreasing CO2 emissions while producing LAB. So it's our next LAB low carbon. We Got definitely it. can produce the next LAB R and low carbon in Canada. So there are come, some tweaks that it can be done during the production. Sure. And finally, the third, uh, the third one that is still not in the market yet, and, and we are targeting to launch it max by 2024, which is our next LAB C mainly next LAB, circular, right? Uh, which means that we are targeting circular raw materials. And that can mm. be for the paraffinic side, for the benzenic side of the molecule. So um, there are also some tweaks uh, for the C version. Yeah, interesting. That's helpful, thank you. So, I mean, when we talked about this, the customer and the market needs are really critical as you guys are developing product and application development. Other than sustainability, and I know that seems to be the biggest driver for all of us, how are those needs changing? What are you, SEPSA and your customers looking at when you look at changing consumer needs? Sure, sure. And and then I, I'm not going to talk only about LAB, right? Because again, 
sustainability, sustainability is driving a lot. When we talk with people, we can see that it changes regionally, but it does, it, it seems to be impacting more and more. However, um, cold washing, which kind of also some sustainability trends, but it is out there. So understanding how to help our customers to improve their formulations on cold washing, right? Because there is not only on sustainability, but there's also on savings because, you know, mm. if you can dishwash, uh, your dishes with cold washing, then you save on temperature and some other things. So there is also money wise, you know, economic uh, evaluation wise. Um, but definitely there are some regulatory trends that are important as well. So um, low dioxane, this is something that has been driven from US and is also driven in, in, in uh, Germany. Uh, so Europe is also all about dioxane, you know, sulfate free for personal care, uh, products. So there are several trends that we need to understand what's going on, listening to the customers and see what are the developments that we need to focus in, in our um, in our innovation pipeline. So yeah. not only talking about Next LAB, but CEPSA also has an innovation pipeline for all of its products, in, especially its surfactants, where we can bring products, new products that we see trends in the market. So what's going on out there and what should we developing, you know, to mitigate customer issues in an overall, but we also can do, you know, uh, what we call the technical system type of project. So there is a specific customer asking me X, Y, Z uh, changes, you know, um, enhancements on their formulation. So we should be doing uh, projects with them specifically for that customer on that level. So yeah. when you talk about innovation, it, it drives from everywhere, not only sustainability, but, you know, enhancement on performance, cost savings and things like that. Yeah. How do you set your priorities priorities in that innovation pipeline? Because that's everyone's greatest challenge, right? There's always a lot of requests uh, the technical team has lots of ideas. The sales team says, if only you could solve this problem, my customers would buy 10 times more. Um, and, and yet I know that you're directly involved, I think, in, in setting those yeah. priorities. <laughs> what does that look like? What's the prioritization process when you're doing that? Oh, boy, I think that you made like one million dollar question. Right. But and I'm not going to say that I have the answer, but we try to. Right. Sure. Um, yes. And prioritization, prioritization of resources, understanding which are the best uh, projects is is part of our kind of day to day discussions. But for definitely we have an innovation pipeline process. So we need to understand which are the ideas that are coming through. Exactly as you said, people can have great ideas, but are they really going to work as projects? Do they mm -hmm. have a return? So there are minimal requirements that we ask for the teams to say, hey, um, nice that you have this idea, but any expectations on the returns? Where are you going? Which markets? Customers? So we have a set of questions on a committee that we do to understand if the yeah. idea can become a project or not. After the, that, the, the, we set up like the projects, uh, the team projects, right? So they have to understand and give us, us a little bit of more on the specifics of what they are expecting on that project. And that drives us variables, uh, like how strategic is the project? Um, what is our return? What we're thinking about it? And we do kind of analysis um, divided in, in different types of matrix that will give us... Um, um, I would say um, quartiles on prioritization. So is this project giving me a good return, but would I have to put a lot of resources, would it be a little bit faster? So there are some tools that we, uh, that we use that will help us to prioritize, not only by a technical issue or you know, solution, but also is it strategic? How in a sustainability environment is this feeding against other projects? And they kind of... Um, um, it's kind of a war against each other because we kind of, you know, plot them all and see, okay, these guys are the ones that I'm going to prioritize these ones. Maybe yeah. I'm just going to, you know, put them on the back. And then the teams need to kind of um, dedicate some time to support and, and, you know, understand if their projects are going forward or not. And then obviously review resources, review timelines, understand if the pipeline is delayed or not. So there is a lot that needs to be done. And I kind of do these reviews, I would say probably once every three months uh, because you need to keep the pipeline running. 
Yeah. Makes sense. It sounds um, similar. Some, I've, I've run through some similar processes before, but I think it's always, as you say, uh, people don't always like what quartile their project ends up in. Um, <laughs> and, and it shifts, it changes, right? Because the market is dynamic. Um, and then of course, as you go through innovations, you're learning along the way, yes. which makes a project more likely to succeed or not, or less likely to succeed as you yeah. go through the discovery process. Yeah, and I'm glad to listen that you, you've been through the same because I think that we all try to prioritize our projects, right? And it's not easy. We get attached to our product projects. So we yeah. have to kind of try to make a rational analysis of the whole thing and definitely make the final selection of what needs to be done. So one of the things we talk about a lot um, on The Chemical Show is the customer experience, right? And so when we look at end-to-end customer experience, it's really a very critical value driver not always fully appreciated across the industry in terms of just how it drives the value. Um, it, but it's also really a key differentiator for businesses. So when you look at SEPSA, what do you consider to be critical to your customer experience and what drives differentiation for you? Um, I believe that especially on, I would say on the LED side, but this is something that we are uh, doing across the board is the type of service level that we have for our customers, LAB. And then I'm just talking about LAB, obviously that would happen with next LAB as well, but uh, because the majority of the industry knows SEPSA as, uh, you know, the LAB supplier, we need to be on time delivery. We need to, if they request a product, we need to be able to deliver them at the right time, at the right moment. Uh, no major mistakes that can also always happen, right? But no major right. mistakes and, and things like that. So as soon as you have the standard or their basis as a great uh, service provider with your basic product, then you can start leveraging your customer experience, right? So it goes back to what we were just saying on listening to to your customers. So it's not only about sales, but also we have our customer development team, uh, which is basically our technical team that is dedicated to our customers, right? So it's segregated from R&D. And in that case is, okay, so hi, Mr. Customer, you know, what do you need? What can we do for you? Let's talk about projects. Let's, let's you know, increase this relationship between us because I need to understand what you're looking for. And marketing has also an important uh, role in this case because what are we seeing in conferences? What are we listening or le- reading in reports? Can we bring to our customers? So pushing our, again, our innovation pipeline to say, hey, Mr. Customer, I'm having something new for you that is going to improve your formulation. So all this for me talks about customer experience. And, and um, the best feedback that I had was when the customers told us, you know what's interesting? I don't feel that we are talking as a supplier and a customer anymore. I feel that we are in a meeting, working in the same company and looking to solve this issue. That that moment for me is pure customer excellence in its finest, you know, because yeah. it's like, okay, we finally reached that bridge. We are not trying to, it, it's finally the win-win situation that we have been looking for. Not yeah, easy, true. not always mm-hmm. happen, but it's it's kind of a thrilled feeling when that happens. Absolutely. True collaboration. Exactly. Yeah. What about digitization? So what role does digitization play for you with your customers um, and kind of just how you go to market? So, um there is a lot of talk on digitalization on, on, on in the industry 4.0, and I think that we need to be uh, uh, we need to have some education about it. We have uh, uh, one of our uh, we have several um, lines of our directors, and we have one dedicated for our, our IT definitely because there are so many new systems in place. And it triggers all points like supply chain, sales, how we do our business in an overall. In my case, in marketing, we are also working at this point with a node platform, for -hmm. instance. So we are trying to explore and understand better how we put our arms uh, into the market for the customers that we still don't know, right? Because um, we don't want to do only the regular business that we do. As I mentioned, we have alcohols and we need to expand on that area as well. So how do we trigger or do we find more customers? And digitalization is definitely helping us to understand 
which are the, the, um, the markets that are looking for, in this case, home and personal care, but which are the markets that are looking for the products, how we're gonna uh, find them and using digital tools will definitely help us. So in the end, I believe that our strategy is to set up ourselves as a easy to do business company that is a digital and modern company and we are, you know, moving path um, on on this on this route. I would say, uh, where we have several different departments working with different pieces on digitalization to bring this experience to our customers, and definitely internally as well, because it makes our process faster, right? Yeah, yeah. If it's done right, data if it's done right, exactly, Absolutely. exactly. So data analysis. I mean, there are so many uh, initiatives for sure. Yeah. Awesome. 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 So let me ask a question in terms of kind of being a woman in leadership in the chemical industry. So, you know, as we, before we hit the record button, we were chatting about this briefly, you know, from your point of view, maybe let's, let me ask this, how do we start attracting more women into the industry? Because I think that's, you know, you can only, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago on the podcast with a, a DEI expert and, you know, she said, and, and we talked about, you can only promote based on what the pool of available candidates is. We can only bring women into the industry that have not just the desire, but they also have the credentials, right? Either as engineers mm. or finance or marketing, whatever it may be. How do we create that success? What's been critical for you and how do you think we help the next generation? Great question. And and and, you, and I think that you, you, you start with the, what you said about the basis. So um, at least in Brazil, now not in Spain because I'm just beginning, but at least in Brazil, I used to be uh, invited into my uh, old university to give some speeches over there. That would yeah. definitely trigger, you know, like women to understand where we could go. So I think that we need to straighten our uh, relationship with our universities or even wherever we are working, you know, we're so global that we can work from everywhere, but straighten relationship with universities or even potentially schools, right? Because it's in school that women, well, everybody actually make the decision of what they're going to do with their lives yeah. just to trigger a little bit more on this uh, pool of people that would be available, right? But definitely uh, we need to... Um, I, I like to have great people working within their teams, right? It can be men, it can be women, it can be different uh, uh, genres, uh, diversity, whatever. It doesn't matter. They need to bring value to the team. Um, women specifically, we definitely uh, can, you know, try to look more for them. Like when you're hiring a intern, you're hiring an analyst, um, a manager, a director, whoever, definitely keep our eyes open and understand the differences between the men and the women that are over there uh, fighting for that job and, and get whoever is the best. I definitely need to say, because we need to be, uh, you know, conscient about that, but give women a little bit more on, on, you know, availabilities or uh, opportunities if so but honestly that's nice what made me be made me like personally speaking be here and hopefully continue to grow is the people that support me so I have mm. and I used to have and I still do but you know great um I would say coaches but not because they were my coach at one point they were my bosses uh, during my whole career, and they used to help me a lot. They understand what we go through. They can help us, giving us advices, supporting what we do, or you know how we tweak some things that needs to be better. And that's for anybody. Again, men, women, whoever. Yeah. But having people that support us, that you can you know just pick up the phone and say, hey, I need help because this 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 is happening doesn't matter if you still work with this person or not that what really makes a difference so having a mentor having someone that helps us makes the difference whenever you're trying to jump in your career and take some different or difficult decisions yeah awesome i think that's great and that's uh i'm gonna just say that's the right answer i think that's coaching and mentoring and having the network to support you is so critical sure. uh for everyone um, to be yes. really be able to thrive 
and grow. Yes. Mm. Feel safe, right? I know, like I, I, mm. I know that I can count with this or that person. And 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 because it this these people will keep helping you to growing, to keep growing in the industry or yeah. whatever your goal is. Maybe your goal is not is to be where you are and that's it. Maybe my goal is to keep traveling. Maybe my goal is to be where I am, but you need people to support you and you feel comfortable to discuss about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I think I've also been fortunate in my career to have some great coaches and mentors and bosses nice. and peers, male, female, um, et cetera, to really, you know, help support and my success. Cause we all need that. For sure. Awesome. Well, Juliana, this has been great. What one final question, just what's next for you and what for SEPSA? Wouldn't we look ahead at the rest of the year? What are your priorities? What should we be looking forward to? For sure. So, I mean, I, I mentioned about next LEB. This is our main objective uh, in an overall. As I mentioned, we have the three. We're still launching the, the next LABC. So it's in the near future. It's We're not going to stop where we are. Uh, there are some technicalities on, on the next LAB, the way that we produce it today, which is based on mass balance. We're looking to have segregated material in the medium long-term future. So... Um, Again, sustainability, making it uh, a product that is going to replace in the future the LAB as a green LAB, our next LAB, is what really is driving our goals, setting up our sustainable plans, where we are moving in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. And not only on LAB, but also on the alcohols and the other products that we also have in our portfolio. So increasing portfolio, um, what we really want to drive is to be the top of mind on sustainability when we talk about surfactants, right? It's starting with LAB, but not stopping there. Keep pushing and mm. increasing our portfolio on the sustainable matters. Yeah, awesome. That's great. Well, Juliana, thank you for joining me today. I've really enjoyed speaking with you and getting to know you better. Thank you so much, Victoria. Have a great day and night and have yeah. to talk. And thanks everyone for joining us today on The Chemical Show. Keep listening, keep following, and keep sharing. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.